I think I'm up. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be together for worship this morning, and welcome to those of you joining us online. I just have one announcement today, and that is that today is the last Sunday that Randy and Carrie will be with us. And so I know, oh, we're grateful. So we have an opportunity to um, say hello to them and thank them personally after the service. Um, there will be many donuts, I understand. <laughs> so please, yay, huh? So please stay for that. Now if you'll stand for the call to worship. We do not gather in vain, for God is working in our hearts. Our worship strengthens and empowers us to share the gospel. Proclaim the news with the good news with boldness. I knew I was forgetting something. Good morning. How are you all doing? Great to see you. Randy, do you remember that? first Sunday, when you asked me to talk more. <laughs> Joke's on you, I guess. <laughs> Do you know, I feel incredibly privileged to be up here for the past eight or nine weeks or something like that, uh, and I've been at this church for about four years now, uh, because I've seen both sides in, uh, in some pretty close ways, and as a congregant, I think Randy's role is you know, on the surface, fairly minimal, but the past, uh, I didn't mean that like it sounded. I'm sorry. Um, but as I've, uh, as I've been more involved in worship planning and all the rest, it's, it's been so impressive to watch you work, Randy. It's been such a privilege. Um, you know, I don't think any of us, when Randy got here, could have prayed for a kinder heart and a more precise hand to lead us through the past couple of years. And uh, just your considerate theology and everything else, it's been such a privilege to walk you, watch you work. And uh, as we gather and worship here today, I hope that we can dedicate this song this morning to new beginnings and, uh, and the way that Randy's led us through and helped us shape and grow through all the, the crushing and the breaking that we've been through. Let's join together and sing this song.
Please have a seat. Well, let me invite our newly elected officers to come forward. They are elders, deacons, and trustees, and you can just stand here in front of me. One of the most joyful um, parts of being a transition pastor is working with these um, different boards of the church. And um, I'll just be honest with you, there was some conflict between these boards. When I came, not everybody was just eager to jump on and serve, for good reason. But now this year, the, the work of Ted, our trustee elder development team, deacon t development team, uh, has really um, been thoughtful and prayerful, and each of you have been discerned to be called to this office of either trustee, deacon, or elder. And it's, it's just what a privilege to be able to ask you these ordination questions. So here we go. I have a question for, some questions for all of you, and then uh, one for trustees, elders, and deacons. So you'll figure it out. First, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you boldly declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church. Do you? I do. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, the unique witness to Jesus Christ, and the authority for Christian faith and life? Do you? I do. And will you receive, adopt, and be bound by the essential tenets of eco, as a reliable exposition of what scripture teaches us to do and to believe. And will you be guided by them in your life and ministry? Will you? Will. Relying on the Holy Spirit, do you humbly submit to God's call on your life, committing yourself to God's mission and fulfilling your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and guided by our confessions? Do you? And will you be governed by ECO's polity and discipline? And will you be accountable to your fellow elders, deacons, trustees, and pastors as you lead? Will you? Well. And do you promise to be faithful in maintaining the truth of the gospel and the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Will you? I will. And for the elders, if you could step forward. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people in their worship, nurture, and service to God? Will you? And for the deacons, if you could step forward. Will you be faithful deacons, serving the people, urging concern, and directing the people's help? to those in need. Will you? And trustees, will you be good stewards of the assets of this congregation and work in full partnership with your fellow trustees subject to our bylaws and polity? Will you? I will. And for the congregation, do we, the covenant partners of this congregation, accept these men and women as elders, deacons, and trustees? chosen by God through your voice to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ according to the word of God and the constitution of ECO? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? All right, if, you, uh, if we could invite reserve elders and current serving elders to come forward and to lay hands. And the rest of you, if you could reach out a hand of blessing as we pray. <clears throat> so these reserve elders that have come forward represent um, 
men and women that have been ordained and installed to the office of elder, going back to Bob Erder's tenure here as pastor, and then under Peter and Eric as well. And what a privilege that you have to have reserve elders. And I know that um, the elders, the currently serving elders, appreciate your prayer, and you may, you may get a, a, a nudge to serve in a, in a variety of ways. But now, let's pray for these newly installed and ordained elders and deacons and trustees. God, Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit upon these women and men who have come today seeking your blessing, feeling the weight of this responsibility, but knowing that they will be sustained, nurtured under your providential care. So fill them, encourage them, give them wisdom, walk with them all the days of their lives and during this time of service, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, it's appropriate to applaud. <laughs> And let me invite you to stand for this marvelous hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. You may be seated. And let me invite our young disciples. Kids, come forward and you can take a seat on the carpet. And I have a final message for you. Come on down. All right. All right. 
So, so later after Sunday school, you're invited to donuts. Now, why are we having donuts today after church? Does that? Because, any... because uh, two of the church people who ha have been here for mm -hmm. a long time are weaving next Sunday. That's and right. I love donuts. Two. You love donuts, good, Avery. Well, that's great. So, two of the church people. Do you know who those two church people? Let me invite the other church person. Come on up here, <laughs> Carrie. We're the two church people that are leaving. But let me, let me share. So, so this is what's happening right now in my heart. I'm happy and I'm sad at the same time. That's kind of strange feelings, isn't it? But you know what the Bible says? That, we, that there is a quality that the Holy Spirit gives us called joy. And joy is different than being happy. Joy can be sadness and happiness at the same time. And we are happy. Why are we happy? Not because we're leaving you. No, because we're going to go see our grandchildren who are young disciples in a different church, and they live a long way from here, a thousand miles. And they have missed us. In fact, my granddaughter, who is 11, said to me last summer, are you coming home, Pop-Pop? And I said, no, I'm, I'm here and going to be in Boulder. And she said, Pop-Pop, can't you just get a job in Spokane? <laughs> and she is so excited that I can come to her soccer games. And our grandson, Nolan, is also excited. And he plays soccer, too. So we're looking forward to that. So we're happy, but we are sad. Because we're going to miss you and your moms and dads and everybody who's gathered in our church family. But guess what? I bet in the future we might come back and visit. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Visits are great. Yeah. So. Stay tuned and say, when, when are those two church people who are leaving coming back to visit? Ask your mom and dad, and I bet they'll know, because they might even announce it the week before, something like that. So let me say to you, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, the one who is who helps our hearts around the corner. That's what the Holy Spirit is in a tribal language in Mexico. So let's pray. God, thank you for each of these young disciples. Thank you that they are deeply loved by you, by their moms and dads, by their aunts and uncles and grandparents, cousins, and they're loved by this church family at Grace Commons. So, Lord, bless them and keep them all the days of their lives. And bless us, we pray through Jesus. Amen. All right, time for Sunday school and donuts afterwards. <laughs>
And it's one of the most encouraging letters in all of the New Testament. And Paul probably sent this letter along with Timothy, who had served as a kind of transitional pastor for the church in Thessalonica. And most likely, the, the entire letter of 1 Thessalonians would have been read during Sunday worship. Now, I'm not going to read the whole letter today, but I encourage you to read it on your own. So let me go ahead and read chapter 2, verses 7 to 13. Hear God's word. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with you, each of you, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into the kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. A breastfeeding mother. That's not the dominant vision of what it means to be a pastor in North America today. But I am so grateful to watch, coming out of the pandemic, what appears to be a resurgence in biblically faithful ministry, a growing reformation in the company of pastors, people that are committed to cultivating the spiritual gifts of peace and patience and gentleness. Those three together create something which I would call pastoral gentleness. And it's a quality that I need more and more in my own ministry, and all pastors need this quality. And I am so proud of your PNC because of the priority that they placed on this, these three gentleness, peace, patience, pastoral gentleness. And I know, a little bird told me, that they are getting very close to the end of the search. Not close enough to tell you more than that. But gentleness was high on their list as they discerned who God is calling to be your next pastor. Gentleness comes out of deep spiritual maturity. The gentle influence people in a way that domineering cannot. In ways that God uses to actually transform rather than coerce people. And Paul was never interested in just telling people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Because he knew what ultimately changed people was a life of consistently walking in the Holy Spirit. And when you experience a pastor who is gentle, you want to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit, and you want to pray, God, change me from the inside out. Now, Paul didn't start out very gentle. He was a terrible man, a Pharisee, a zealous protector of the law who led bands of people to arrest, persecute, and even murder new Christians. But as Paul matured in his own faith and ministry, he learned gentleness. Paul never had the privilege of being a pastor for a long season. He was an itinerant apostle. He never stayed in any church for very long. Of Ephesus, maybe two years. 
but he grew deeply attached to the men and women that he worked with as he planted churches all around the Mediterranean. In Thessalonica, he grew especially close to this young church in the three months that he spent. And he asked Timothy to become their pastor. So when he describes the closeness of their relationship, he uses this image of a mother breastfeeding her children. And then he doubles down, using a word, it's another hapax legomena, like last week, but it's a word used nowhere else in the New Testament. I'm a, I can't even pronounce it, I, me, romenoi. And you, it's so hard to translate it, this into English. The NIV says, because we loved you so much, that was our reading. The message is better, we loved you dearly. The NRSV translates it, so deeply did we care for you. But I think the King James captures the Greek the best. So being affectionately desirous of you. Paul is affectionately desirous of the women and men in Thessalonica. And that captures my heart for Grace Commons. This was not just a stop on my pastoral journey. As it turns out, you will probably be the only church that I've served in this kind of situation, where I was called against my will, <laughs> but God spoke so clearly, you will go to Boulder. And then I just knew in my spirit as I watched the way your PNC was at work last spring, I said, they are, they are about to get the very best pastor. Someone like is being described by Paul here, and I knew I gotta get out of the way. And you were so close, and I am so tempted to tell you more. <laughs> but Janet has reminded me that's all I can say. Thank you, Janet. So being affectionately desirous of you, I feel those feelings so deeply in my heart, and, and Carrie does as well. As we have prayed for you, as we have celebrated your 150th anniversary, as we have thought about all of the challenges that you faced and that you will face, our hearts have been deeply drawn to you. Oh, we have to keep going. A gentle, gentleness is important, and it, it appears in other parts of the New Testament, other writings of Peter and Paul. An overseer is God's steward, must not be quick-tempered, but self-controlled and disciplined. An overseer must be gentle, not quarrelsome. And I exalt, exhort the elders among you not to domineer over those in your charge. These are the qualities of pastor. Along with this text that makes so clear to me the kind of person called into this ministry. Here's a Roman Thessalonian father with his young child, and that's the second image that Paul uses, that of an encouraging father. This Greek word encouraging can also be translated exhort. And Paul, for added measure, throws in the word urge. There is an exhorting or prophetic word that the pastor must bring from time to time. But if you only hear the prophetic urging and never the gentle encouragement, you haven't got it quite right. It's finding that balance. So pray for your new pastor that they will have that wisdom to bring those two in good measure. John Calvin, in his commentary on this text, writes these words 500 years ago. 
Paul insists more especially on those things which belong to his office. He has compared himself to a nurse, now he compares himself to a father. What he means is this, that he was concerned in regard to them, just as a father is wont to be, that's to his sons. And that he had exercised a truly paternal care in instructing and admonishing them. And unquestionably, no one will ever be a good pastor unless he shews himself, that's Old English for shows himself, to be a father to the church that is committed to him. Well, I hope so far what I've said is encouraging to you. I have one more exhortation, though, before I'm done. To give that, you might want to turn in your Bible in the, in the pews, or if you have one on your phone, to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. It's not on the slides, but I'm going to read it to you. I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friends, there has been division at Grace Commons. Much healing has happened, and more will come. And I am confident that God has called a wonderful shepherd and I know you will come together in unity to embrace a new season of ministry as you welcome their ministry among you. And I hope you will not only welcome them, but welcome their pastoral ministry and leadership. Pastoral leadership doesn't just involve teaching and preaching, that's the public part. There is also oversight. And that's why in the New Testament, pastors are called elders and overseers. The sermon is, is simply the beginning of the ministry of the pastor. And where a pastor is giving themselves transparently as an encouraging father and a nursing mother, it is remarkable how much authority they can handle. People want to follow a servant leader. And I know that the PNC had that foremost in their mind. So pray for them and your new pastor and your remarkable staff. Pray for the elders and deacons and trustees that we've ordained and installed today and for those who are continuing to serve as they seek to serve you with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And friends, jump in with both feet to serve alongside them. Well, the last point Paul makes is verse 13, which says, Let's get it right, Randy. And we also thank, wait, that's verse, that's chapter one. Oh, there we go. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Ryan Fullerton says, preachers are aware of many things, and if we're not careful, we'll become subtly unaware of the main thing. We are mounting the pulpit to share the very words of the living God. 
It's a mystery how an ordinary human can stand here and bring you the very words of God. But that is what Paul and the consistent teaching of Scripture says. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God's Word is exposited and becomes for us the very Word of God. Now, Paul's preaching was just as human as my preaching today. But he reminds the Thessalonians that the Word came not only from us, he and Timothy and Silas, from ordinary guys, people with real time constraints, with self-awareness. Many of Paul's cohorts were aware they were not always great preachers. It comes from people with illnesses. Paul had terrible problems with his eyes. He had that thorn in his flesh. Timothy had issues with his stomach. And people who can ramble in their sermons. Just read Ephesians chapter 3, and you'll see Paul rambling. But the word that they spoke was not the words of men. Though it came immediately from human beings, it came ultimately from God. And true to form, the word from God came with powerful, life-changing results. It was at work in these believers in Thessalonica. It birthed in them saving faith, laboring love, and steadfast hope, Paul says in chapter 1. It filled them with the Holy Spirit's power and deep conviction. And so powerful was God's word that it made in them God's invisible work of election visible. The Word of God made them imitators of the churches of God in Christ, like it did everywhere in the known world and continues to do today. It comes with a power that says, let there be light, a power that says the light of the glory of Christ shines in the hearts of those who hear us. Calvin says this word produces in God's people such reverence, fear, and obedience inasmuch as people touched with a feeling of divine majesty will never allow themselves to play games with it. That is the word that we preach from this pulpit. And finally, 1 Thessalonians has a clear word from God about our collective future. While I read that word, I want to show you a slide of a new painting by a young Ukrainian artist. It shows the horrors of war's destruction in black and white in the background, but emerging in the midst of all of the horrors of war, in, in the midst of such evil that we have not seen in generations, it shows the beauty of God's new world breaking in. There's a little Ukrainian Orthodox church in a beautiful stand of green, evergreen trees in the midst of a meadow. God's world is going to break in. Here's how Paul puts it in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Friends, we will meet again one day. I hope it's here in Boulder. But I know by the authority of God's word that we will meet in the kingdom of God that has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the saints of 
boulder here at Grace Commons. Those gathered here in this room, those watching online, and those scattered, that Lord, you are nurturing along. Oh, Father, pr I pray for them. I pray that you would guide and direct by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would usher in a season of new ministry, new hope, new life, as this body of believers shares the gospel that Paul preached so powerfully in this place, here in Boulder and beyond. I ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Praise the Lord.
I want to start with some family news. Uh, Sally Duvall passed away on Tuesday, July 25th, so let's keep her family uh, in our prayers. Let's pray together. Father, we do lift up those who loved and knew Sally and are grieving. We lift them up to you and to your care. And today, Father, we come in grateful awe into your holy presence. We worship you that we can come cleansed and clothed in the righteousness of Christ alone because he took the punishment for our sin upon himself and set us free. How we worship and thank you for your great love, mercy, and plan of salvation. Thank you for the gift of your spirit to guide and empower us to live as you call us to live. Thank you that you are with us through every day, teaching us to walk by faith, showing us ever more about who you are and about the depths of your love for us. Thank you for increasingly creating your beautiful character within us. We confess our wandering, our distraction, and self-preoccupation. We forget your loving kindness and try to solve things ourselves, our way. We fail to do what you teach us to do, and we keep doing what you warn us not to do. Please forgive us again, as you promised to do, and cleanse us afresh. We worship you for your grace that is greater than all our sin and your readiness to embrace us when we turn back to you. Father, today we thank you for the mothers and fathers, the mentors and teachers, the elders and pastors you have provided in our lives and in our church. They have loved and comforted us, taught and corrected us, encouraged and challenged us, and lived as examples before us. We thank you on this particular day for your servants, Randy and Carrie Bear. Thank you for bringing them to us for this season and for their willingness to follow your call. May they know how much we love and appreciate them. We are grateful for their warmth and their care for us, for what they have taught us, for their prayers for us, and for the healing that you have brought. Thank you for Randy's faithful, strong, and gentle leadership. We have been blessed by his kindness and encouragement. We pray you will richly bless them as they transition into the plans you have for them next. May they continue to grow in the knowledge of you and in the enjoyment of your deep love for them. Please continue to use them effectively for your glory in the lives of their family, and those to whom they will minister next. Make your face shine upon them and give them peace. Father, for ourselves as your church here at Grace Commons, we pray that you will prepare our hearts for our new pastor by showing us as you're gracious to do where we fall short as a flock. Please show us where we fail to love, to seek unity, or to put the needs of our brothers and sisters before our own. Show us where we fail to encourage or build each other up, where we fail to pray for each other and for our leaders. Please help us to see the great gifts you give to us in each other, in our pastors, our staff members, and all who serve. We marvel as we consider the way you equip each of us to be part of your body here and part of your church at large. By your spirit, please grow us in love, humility, and unity so that we will glorify you and reflect you in a way that is attractive to people who don't know you yet. And Father, we continue to pray for our new pastor. Thank you for faithfully guiding our nominating committee in their search and discernment process. Please bless the final stages yet ahead. We trust and are grateful for your provision of a shepherd to care for us. We pray for the person you are calling to lead us. Give him clarity in the sense of your call and bless the transition from his current home, places of service and friendships. Equip our new pastor with energy and passion and a deep dependence on you. Please help us to welcome him and his family with warmth and gratitude. And as Randy said, to to jump in and serve along beside him. Father, we have many other concerns on our hearts, but we close for now by praying together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you'll please stand for our final hymn. You can be seated. Oh, we're going to come up here because we are important. I am Emily Kreider. I'm your pastor of Family Ministry. This is Lindsay. Go ahead. Lindsay Waymeyer. I'm the director of spiritual formation and discipleship here. And we are here to roast Randy on his way out. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, Jackson was so nice. We need to just stir the pot a little. Okay. I'm kidding. We're here to honor you. Uh, and give thanks to God for the work that Randy and Carrie have done. Um, you've heard plenty from me on the pulpit, from the pulpit, um, just explaining how much I love uh, Randy and Carrie and our work together the last couple of years. But one thing you may not know is I think the reason um, there has been healing, there has been a sense of unity among us, there has been movement of the Lord in our midst is because these people are praying people. And they've shared stories of all of the people across the United States who have prayed for us. They have a posse of prayerful intercessors who have kept our doors open, folks, and have been on their knees for our flourishing. And we have seen God move in our midst in light of that, I truly believe. And so I give thanks to God for that. And I thanks to you for your faithfulness. Anything you wanna say? No, we realized too late we should have done a bloopers reel. Because so much of what both Randy and Carrie provide for us is levity and, and a lightness of spirit that keep us uh, connecting in humor and love and grace. So, so grateful for that. But another thing is um, really to have the model in these two, um, apart from one another, but as a couple. They have really uh, shown us what it looks like uh, to lean on and live with the Lord every day in the highs and the lows, and so grateful for the model that they have been for us to watch, not just learn from, but to see it in you. So thank you for your maturity and your grace and so much peace that you've brought to us. Thank you. But we're not the only ones who had something to say. So we put a little video together. Actually, Kier did. If you see Kier someday, thank you, Kier. Here's a video we have on your behalf. most about Randy is his patient wisdom. 
One thing I appreciate about Randy is how invested he has been in our well-being as a church, as individuals, and as the body of Christ. What I appreciate about Randy is his steadfastness to Grace Commons. I appreciate Randy for all the thankless tasks that he's undertaking with grace and straightforwardness and good humor and humility. What I appreciate about Randy is his willingness to really get involved in the situation and to contribute in very meaningful and significant ways. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate Randy's calm and approachable nature. What I appreciated about Randy was his ability to keep the main thing the main thing and keep those meetings moving. There are actually several things that I appreciate most about Randy. Um, I would say, first of all, his kindness, uh, his approachability, and his willingness to make space for others to lead and to serve. Thank you, Randy. What I learned from Randy was being humble but firm. What I've learned the most from Randy is that a little bit of patience some experienced wisdom, and a lot of prayer can get you through life's most troubled waters. Thank you, Randy, for all you've done for us. We will miss you a lot. One thing I learned is how to keep dreaming and looking forward into the future. Thanks, Randy. What I will miss most about Randy is what a calm, reassuring, unflappable presence he has been. The thing I miss most about Randy Bear is his wife, Carrie. She's the wife. <laughs> what I'm going to miss most about Randy is our three o'clock meetings every Monday that can happen anytime between the hours of 12 and 5. <laughs> if they happen, I'm going to miss that. Randy, thank you for your steadfast guidance during this transitional period. Thank you, Randy, for guiding us through our transition. Best wishes and God's peace. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. You're a self-sacrificing leader who loves Jesus and knows um, how to do the right thing, even if it's hard. Thanks again. Hi, Randy. Thank you so much for caring for the Grace Commons congregation during the time that you've been here. We really appreciate it. When I think about Randy when he came to Grace Commons, I think about his wisdom, what I call Randy wisdom. He could look at a complicated situation, envision a future, always led by the Holy Spirit, and help us move forward. Randy, thanks for your wisdom. Randy wisdom. Wonderful. Well, I, this time I want to invite Randy and Carrie to come on up. This is the part where we roast. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just dying to have like a little roast moment. Okay. We've put together a little basket for you. Lindsay's going to tell you about it. So it's good to know that you're leaving with fond memories because we were afraid we were going to have to send you off with things to remind you fond fondly of your time here. So we just got you a little gift basket to send you off with. I'll set it down so I can share a few things. Janet really helped us oh, sure. in collaboration with some of these things. So here's a Liberty Puzzle of Chautauqua. Wow. So y'all can do that again and again with your friends when you're entertaining. And remember, there's a, a deck of cards. I don't know if y'all play cards, but it has the 14ers on it. So you can plan your next trip and which 14er <laughs> you're going to climb. You didn't get to that while you were here, did you? Um, yeah, you're going to actually have some time to do some of these things, maybe. Um, this last item was kind of funny. Um, very familiar to how many of you? Raise your hand if you own one of these. Look at that, Emily. What do you know? Hey, you know, listen. Emily has never heard of this cookbook. Call her I would cookbook. be a grateful recipient, folks. <laughs> She herself Look. is a foodie, but she'd never heard of the Colorado Cash. Are you kidding Look, me? I grew up in Seattle. Leave Whatever. me alone. Go. So for you all who are also foodies, you can remember us as you dive into this. So what else do we have in there, Emily? Well, we've got some Palisade peaches and a little bit of um, Boulder County coffee, which is delicious. 
But I just thought, if you were here last week and you saw my girls get baptized, I just thought that if any, Randy ever ran into an emergency where he needed this moment, that, that he would need his own holy hydro flask. <laughs> So, so this is your own holy hydro flask, and I wanted to have it engraved, but I didn't have enough time because of last week. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. So thoughtful and generous. I am overwhelmed. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. I mean, Carrie. Whatever, you're the same now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I will miss Carrie. Carrie and I um, have had privilege to work together for a very long time, and we will continue in relationship. But all this to say, uh, we, we love you both. We're so grateful to you. Uh, we know that you stand together um, as folks who've prayed for this community and worked so diligently and carefully um, to follow the Lord and to be faithful to this call. And we're so grateful for that. Um, anything you want to say before I give some instructions? You don't get to do your benediction oh, yet. Yeah. Anything? I, I've said it. Great. And Carrie said it. She got the microphone. So we've invited Randy to uh, give his charge and benediction um, before they leave. But please, would you remain in your seats and let Carrie and Randy get out the, through the middle of the aisle. They are going to be out in the atrium for you to take a moment to say thank you, perhaps drop a card and enjoy some donuts after the benediction. But please stay and enjoy the postlude. Um, and let's hear from Randy once more. Oh, yeah, you amped up. Before I uh, give this benediction, I've already given you the charge. One is enough. You have these lovely ministers of prayer who would love to pray with you, and there's enough donuts that you can pray for a long time, so get one. So they're available after the service. But now, receive this word from the Apostle Paul. Now, unto him who is able exceedingly able to give I, I forgot it <laughs> time to retire now unto him is able, who is exceedingly able to bless you and keep you <laughs> all the days of your life our Lord Jesus Christ that great shepherd of the sheep who will shepherd you through all the chapters ahead unto him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.